Named Optimus Princeps, or the best emperor during his time, Trajan has been remembered as one of the best Roman emperors, and he presided over a period of renewed conquest, and during his reign the empire would reach its greatest extent and a true start of the golden age of the Roman Empire. Marcus Ulpius Trianus, now commonly referred to as Trajan, was born on September the 18th, 53 AD, in the city of Italica, a Roman colony founded after the Second Punic War in Spain. This made Trajan the first Roman emperor not born in Italy. Trajan had a fairly conventional upbringing and a traditional education, and he showed early on his preference for hunting, physical and military activities over any academic pursuits. He was the son of Marcia, a Roman noblewoman and sister-in-law of Emperor Titus, and Marcus Ulpius Trianus the Elder, a well-respected senator who served with Vespasian in the First Jewish-Roman War in 66 AD, and supported Vespasian's bid for the imperial throne in 69 AD. And for his loyalty to the new emperor, he was granted a consulship and elevated to patrician status and would be appointed the governor of Syria in 76 AD, where Trajan served under his father, as a military tribune. Trajan would later transfer to serve as a tribune in one of the legions of the Rhine frontier, and it seems that he saw active combat duty during both of these commissions. He served as a military tribune far longer than was usual. He seemed to have thrived in the army. Unfortunately, much of Trajan's early career can't be reconstructed in any detail due to the lack of sources. After his time as tribune, he held various civic posts, until he was appointed as legate of the 7th legion stationed in Hispania Terraconensis. And in 89 AD, when the governor of Germania Superior revolted against Emperor Domitian with the aid of the Chatti tribe, Trajan was quick to respond and quickly mustered his legion and marched to defend his emperor. But the rebellious legions were defeated before Trajan could get there. It seems that the legion stayed on the Rhine frontier and even carried out some punitive raids across the Rhine and against the Chatti tribe. Domitian took notice of Trajan's eagerness to defend him against the rebellious governor and rewarded him with a consulship in 91 AD. After his consulship, Trajan was granted a provincial governorship on the frontier, where he would further prove his loyalty towards Domitian by defeating some German tribes raiding Roman land. When Emperor Domitian was killed in the imperial palace in 96 AD, the Senate greeted the news with joy and appointed a man from their own ranks to become the new emperor, an elderly senator by the name of Nerva. The Praetorian Guard, however, was less ecstatic about the change of emperor, and when Nerva refused to deal with Domitian's assassins, they took action into their own hands and kidnapped the new emperor and forced him to promptly order the execution of the conspirators. Being an elderly man and in poor health, and without any children to inherit the throne, Nerva decided to adopt Trajan as his successor and son. The adoption of Trajan satisfied the guard and brought a measure of stability to the political situation in Rome. Nerva sent a handwritten note announcing his decision to Trajan, and in this note he urged Trajan to take revenge against the Praetorian guards who had humiliated him. Trajan was governor of Germania Inferior at the time, when news arrived of Nerva's choice to make him his successor news of his succession was brought to him by the future emperor Hadrian, who was Trajan's ward. Hadrian's father was a cousin to Trajan, but when he had died in 86, Trajan became the guardian of the boy. Soon thereafter, news arrived that Nerva had passed away, after only 15 months on the throne, making Trajan the new emperor of Rome. The New Emperor It's unknown if Trajan knew of Nerva's plan to adopt him ahead of time, though there's always been the suspicion that the adoption was engineered by Trajan's friends in Rome, who would have put pressure on the elderly emperor. Either way, it proved to be a very good choice for everyone concerned. Upon his ascension to emperor, Trajan was in no hurry to get to Rome. Instead, he inspected the Rhine and Danube frontiers to not only safeguard against the Dacians, but also to test the allegiance of the many legions still loyal to Domitian. And he also summoned the Praetorian guards, who had kidnapped and extorted Nerva and had them executed. Trajan entered Rome in the latter part of 99 AD, and he did so on foot, greeting the masses who had come to meet their new emperor, and he made sure to embrace all the senators who had come to meet him. Pliny, 
who was an eyewitness to Trajan's entrance to Rome, wrote this. Neither age nor health nor sex held back those who wished to feast their eyes on the unexpected sight. Small children learnt who you were, young people gazed rapturously, the aged marveled, and the bedridden, scorning their doctor's orders, left their sick beds as if a glimpse of you could restore their health. Among the crowds there were some who said that their life was fulfilled now that they had caught a glimpse of you, while others claimed that you gave them reason for living longer. Women rejoiced in their voluptuous fecundity, as never before in the knowledge that now they brought forth citizens for a princeps to rule and soldiers for an imperator to command. All felt the same joy at your arrival, joy which increased with each step you took, your splendid physique seemingly growing with each stride. This projection of modesty was a far cry from the last days of Domitian's reign, and it would become Trajan's hallmark throughout his reign. As Trajan made sure to placate the Senate, and treated them with dignity and respect, and he, like most emperors before him, promised that he would refrain from executing any senator during his reign, but unlike most emperors, Trajan actually kept his word, and no senator was put to death during his 19-year reign. Whereas Domitian had pleased the army but not the senate, and Nerva pleased the senate but not the army, Trajan showed that he was the man to gratify both. But in reality, Trajan concentrated power in his own hands, just like his predecessors, but he did so with tact and flattering speeches. Trajan's popularity amongst his peers was such that the Senate bestowed upon him the honorific of Optimus, meaning the best. It was a title that had been reserved for Rome's supreme deity on the Capitoline Hill, Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Jupiter the best and greatest. The First Dacian War during Domitian's reign, the empire had seen increased aggression from Dacia, who bordered Roman territory along the Danube. They had, under their king Decebalus, started raiding Roman territory and inflicted serious defeats on the Romans. While Domitian had tried to deal with the situation, his campaigns ended in a deeply unsatisfactory way, with a treaty where Rome had to pay Decebalus a yearly indemnity and sent him engineers to help build roads and fortifications. These terms suggested that Rome had lost the war, which of course was unacceptable. So Trajan planned a new campaign to achieve a far more beneficial treaty for the Romans, where Rome's superiority over Dacia was clear to all. Unfortunately, much of Trajan's campaign has been lost to history, and only a fragmentary literary account of his campaign exists. We do, however, have Trajan's column, built in Rome to commemorate his campaign, but it's hard to read without a complimentary written account. We can see the Romans crossing over the Danube on a pontoon bridge. And here we can see Trajan conducting a sacrifice outside the camp, probably to war god Mars to ensure military success. In this scene we see Trajan delivering a speech to his soldiers, and in the following scenes we can see Trajan overseeing his soldiers, carrying out labors like building fortifications and clearing away a forest. Followed by negotiations with a captured Dacian, and a few scenes later we see the first battle. It seems primarily the Auxilia force engaged the enemy, perhaps the second Battle of Tepe, which the Romans won. But not decisively, and in fact Rome seems to have suffered heavy casualties, forcing Trajan to retreat south for the winter to regroup and reinforce his army. The Dacians proved to be a deadly foe for the Romans, with their long curved swords called fox, this could reach around the shield and inflict damage on the man behind. The cutting power of this sword was reputed to be devastating, even cutting through shields and helmets. During that winter, King Decebalus, not one to give up the initiative to Trajan, launched a counterattack across the Danube. But the Dacians were defeated in two battles at Moesia. In the following campaigning season, Trajan advanced towards the Dacian capital of Sarmisagathusa through the Iron Gates Pass, while a pincer attack advanced from the east with a lightly armed Moorish cavalry, attacking Decebalus in the rear, perhaps through the Vulcan Pass. And yet another surprise attack, perhaps through the Ott Valley, succeeded in capturing Decebalus' sister. For these reasons, Decebalus was forced to sue for peace in 102 AD. Some minor territories were ceded to Rome, and Decebalus was given some military reinforcement and supplies. Trajan was hoping by having subjugated Decebalus that he could be a powerful ally to Rome, 
who could guard against hostile migrating peoples. The resources Rome sent were instead used to rebuild many of the strategic fortifications Trajan had torn down during his campaign. A massive bridge was also built across the Danube. It would help the Roman army advance faster in case of future wars in Dacia. It was very likely designed by Apollodorus of Damascus, who will come to be Trajan's court architect, designing many of Trajan's future building projects. With Roman prestige restored in the area and a proper peace treaty in place, Trajan set off for Rome. And he entered the capital in triumph, and he was granted the honorary title of Dasicus. And in true Republican tradition, the envoys from Decebalus were brought before the Senate to ratify the peace treaty. Celebratory games and theatrical displays were held in the capital, and a general state of celebration gripped the people of Rome. However, less than two years elapsed before the situation on the Danube frontier once again reached a crisis point. Decebalus had started to rearm and fortify his kingdom, and dispatched embassies to tribes hostile to Rome. And he had attacked Roman forces stationed in the newly occupied territories north of the Danube. Decebalus had also annexed parts of the Lysigian land to the west, as revenge for their support of Rome during the previous war. The Second Dacian War it seems that this renewed hostility caused genuine surprise in Rome. Decebalus was declared an enemy of Rome in June 105 AD. Trajan left Rome to once again march into Dacian land. However, it was far into the campaigning season, so he could only consolidate existing position. Once again, the column is our primary source for the war that ensued. Decebalus made plans to have Trajan assassinated. Auxiliaries who had deserted were instructed to take advantage of the emperor's accessibility at his headquarters and have him killed. The plot was discovered when one of the conspirators acted suspiciously, which led to his prompt arrest and subsequent torture. The Dacians had also managed to capture one of the commanders of the Roman forces, a certain Longinus, who had served with distinction in the previous wars in Dacia. He had been lured into Decebalus's camp with the guarantee of peace talks. Decebalus was hoping by having such a prominent bargaining chip, he could force Trajan to terms. However, Longinus resolved the situation himself by taking his own life before he could be used against the emperor. Meanwhile, in Drabetta, Trajan had been assembling a force large enough to deal with Dacia once and for all. He gathered all available troops in the empire, and vexillations were sent from all around the Roman world. He created two new legions, the second Traiana Fortis, and the 15th Ulpia Victrix. This show of Roman force caused many Dacians to desert Decebalus, who now tried to sue for peace with Trajan. The emperor demanded that Decebalus would surrender himself and all recently acquired weapons. Terms Decebalus could not accept. In the spring of 106, Trajan's campaigns into Dacia began. The goal was clear, to capture the Dacian capital of Sarmisagathusa. The Romans advanced through the Vulcan Pass and the scene on the column suggests that Rome met little resistance, instead showing the Roman army involved in fieldcraft and engineering. Decebalus was outnumbered and very reluctant to face the Roman army in the field, opting for a war of attrition and ambushing detachments before fleeing back into the hill forts in the Carpathian Mountains. The systematic reduction of these strongholds seems to have taken up most of the campaigning in 106. When the Roman army finally arrived at Sarmisagathusa, the city surrendered without a fight. Decebalus, however, was nowhere to be found in the city. He had fled to the mountains, determined to continue the war against Rome. But many Dacian nobles surrendered to Trajan and disclosed the whereabouts to the royal treasury. They had diverted a river and buried the treasure in a riverbed. The emperor ordered the treasure to be recovered, and it proved to be of astonishing value, some 500,000 pounds of gold and twice as much silver. Eventually, Decebalus, who had retreated further into the more remote parts of the Carpathians, was tracked down by Roman auxiliary cavalry. But Decebalus committed suicide before he could be captured. The man who captured Decebalus was a man by the name of Tiberius Claudius Maximus, who had, after his 25 years as legionary, transferred to the auxiliary, where he eventually became the commander of the unit who captured Decebalus. Decebalus' head was parted from his body and taken to the emperor and Maximus received military decorations from a grateful Trajan. 
Decebalus' head was paraded in front of the soldiers and then sent ahead to Rome, where it would be hurled down the stairs of the Capitoline Hill. Dacia had been utterly defeated. Half a million Dacians were taken prisoners, many of whom were sent to Rome to fight as gladiators as a part of Trajan's triumph, and the rest were enslaved. A monumental trophy was erected in Moesia Inferior to commemorate the war, and the structure was consecrated to Mars Ultor, Mars the Avenger. Dacia was incorporated into the Roman Empire, and many of the veterans who had fought in the Dacian Wars now colonized the new province. Upon Trajan's entrance into Rome in the middle of June 107, he was met with numerous embassies from beyond the empire, including one from India, all congratulating the emperor and seeking reassurance that they wouldn't suffer the same fate as Dacia. The emperor was voted another triumph and festivities even more lavish than the last ensued. Called the Dacian Games, this was a spectacle the like of which Rome had never seen, and they lasted for 117 days with a simple purpose, to display Trajan's generosity and Rome's power. Money was distributed to all citizens. Sometime towards the end of the Second Dacian War, the client kingdom of Nabatea was fully incorporated into the empire. Yet again, our sources are sparse on the circumstances surrounding the annexation, but some military action seems to have been required for the subjugation. Trajan's Buildings There had long been a convention for the victorious generals to embellish the city with impressive public buildings, paid for by the spoils of war. So, Trajan undertook and encouraged extensive public works in Rome and in the provinces. Constantine the Great would, 200 years later, call Trajan a creeper that grows on the walls, because so many buildings all around the empire bore his name. He built roads, bridges, and even new ports. He oversaw the construction of a new port in Ostia so as to be better able to satisfy the increased need for grain in Rome. The imperial capital was a huge metropolis at this time, which needed to import enormous amounts of grain. And naturally, Trajan's most famous building projects were in the capital itself. A vast new forum was built, the biggest of them all, Trajan's Forum, that included a basilica, two libraries, a new market, and crowning the new forum was Trajan's Column, an innovative spiral relief illustrating Trajan's conquest of Dacia. In front of the column, a temple was erected. Trajan failed to dedicate this temple to any deity, but it would be a temple to Trajan after his death. The Romans could not accept a living emperor dedicating a temple to his own honor while he was still alive. He also constructed a massive public bath complex right above the one built by Titus. And it would come to dwarf the earlier bath. An aqueduct was built to bring more water into the capital and to help supply his new bath. The brain behind many of these projects was Apollodorus of Damascus, originally a military engineer from the Greek-speaking eastern provinces, and his designs incorporate a mix of Roman, Greek, and even elements of the Near East. The variety in design could symbolize the massive size of the empire. Trajan's Internal Affairs Trajan married a woman from southern Gaul, Platina. While they never had any children of their own, they seemed to have been very happy together. Trajan's friend Pliny wrote this about Platina. She was an exemplary model of the ancient wifely virtues obedient to her husband in a spirit of reciprocal understanding and consistently faithful to the habits he inculcated in her. Demure and unassuming in her attire and entourage, she even accompanied Trajan on foot, whenever custom allowed, revealing an unswerving devotion to him and not his position. Platina and Marciana, Trajan's older sister, were both granted the title of Augusta. Marciana was close to her brother and often traveled with him and assisted him in decision-making. Marciana's grandchild, Vibia Sabina, would later marry the future emperor, Hadrian. Trajan made efforts to help the poor, specifically children in Italy, by setting aside public money to provide for their upkeep, a sort of rudimentary welfare scheme. This system would last for almost 200 years. While Trajan did many good things, he was not perfect. One of our sources claims that Trajan was too fond of boys and wine, and that he took too much pleasure in war. But his fellow soldiers liked him. Trajan often shared his soldiers' hardship in campaign, walking on foot and fording rivers with his army. 
Pliny would later publish many of his personal letters. Some of them still survive to this day. One correspondence with Trajan is of particular interest. Pliny had been sent out to govern Bithynia in Asia Minor because there seems to have been some inconsistencies in the financial reporting. Pliny sent a letter to Trajan asking for advice on how to deal with the growing Christian population in the province, and this is how Trajan responded. You have followed the right course of procedure, my dear Pliny. In your examination of the cases of persons charged with being Christians, for it is impossible to lay down a general rule to a fixed formula. These people must not be hunted out. If they are brought before you and the charge against them is proved, they must be punished. But in the case of one who denies that he is Christian and makes it clear that he is not by offering prayers to our gods, he is to be pardoned as a result of this repentance, however suspect his past conduct may be. But pamphlets circulated anonymously must play no part in any accusation. They create the worst sort of precedent and are quite out of keeping with the spirit of our age. Pliny's letter shows the extent of Christianity's spread in the empire and the decentralized nature of the ancient world. It also exemplifies Trajan's personal attitude towards legal matters. Trajan's response is blunt and uncompromising concerning the matter of the law, but emphasized magnanimity where possible. The Parthian Campaign Hadrian had been sent to the eastern provinces, probably as the governor of Syria to make preparations for an impending campaign against Rome's greatest enemy, the Parthian Empire. The pretext for the war seems to have been Rome's relation with the Armenian king. A new king had been installed with the Parthian crown. The treaty between Rome and Parthia had ever since Nero stated that the Armenian king would be a man from Parthia, but he would be crowned by Rome. This new king clearly broke the treaty and therefore stipulated a just cause for war. Even though the Parthians had backed off, Trajan refused any terms. He wanted war. The peace with Parthia had always been uneasy. All other tribes and kingdoms neighboring Roman territory were reduced to subservient client states. Parthia, however, had always remained fully independent and strong. For years, Rome had amassed supplies in the east in preparation for this war. In 114, Trajan started his campaign by going into Armenia and reducing it to a Roman province. And in successive years, he would conquer Mesopotamia, most of the Parthian heartland, and its capital, Tessiphon. Trajan penetrated as far as the Persian Gulf. The Senate in Rome awarded him the title of Parthicus and said that he could hold as many triumphs as he wanted to. Parthia had put up little resistance to Trajan's advance. They were embroiled in a civil war at the time, so could put up little coordinated resistance. While besieging the city of Hatra, Trajan was almost struck by a missile shot from a wall. A cavalryman and his escort was hit and killed. The emperor was not wearing any symbols of rank, hoping not to stand out. But Trajan was in his 60s at the time of this, so seniority was clear to all. And Hatra would prove too difficult to siege in the desert sun, so the Roman army was forced to withdraw. And while it seems that Trajan wanted to fully annex the conquered territories into direct Roman rule, he was forced to withdraw from Mesopotamia when another Jewish revolt broke out in the empire and soldiers needed to be reallocated to deal with the situation. And the Parthian land proved to be hard to control. Small rebellions sprung up all over Mesopotamia, attacking Roman supply lines. Death of a Princeps It proved to be impossible for Rome to hold its new territory and deal with the revolts inside the empire at the same time. Whether this was a coordinated revolt between the Jewish population and Parthia is unknown, but it's probably fair to say that the Jewish population throughout the empire saw their chance with the majority of the Roman forces occupied in the east. So Trajan returned to Antioch in 117, and by the time he got there, most of the conquered territories had been lost. Due to his failing health, he suffered a stroke, which left him partially paralyzed. He was determined to continue his campaign, but he was advised against it. And given his poor health, Trajan decided to return to Rome, and celebrate his Parthian triumph, and he left Hadrian in overall command of the armies in the east. And while traveling along the Cilician coast, his condition suddenly worsened, so they pulled into the nearest harbor, Salinas, where the elderly emperor would eventually die. Trajan had never considered his imminent death, and had left no clear instructions concerning the succession, and he had no children. It has been suggested that perhaps he wanted the senate to appoint a suitable successor, 
Nonetheless, rumors suggest that Platina, Trajan's wife, who was believed to have been infatuated with Hadrian, had actually concealed Trajan's death and smuggled in someone to impersonate the emperor with a suitably feeble voice, so that she could consort with the Praetorian prefect and ensure that Hadrian's adoption could be announced before the news of the death was made public. Fueling these speculations is the fact that the imperial correspondence announcing the adoption was signed by Platina and not Trajan. But perhaps the emperor's failing health and the partially paralyzing stroke may have caused Platina to help the dying emperor. Either way, Hadrian was in a strong position at the time, controlling the armies in the east, so no one challenged his ascendance to the imperial throne. Trajan's body was brought to Hadrian, who had the old emperor cremated, and his ashes were brought to Rome in a golden urn, which was placed at the foot of his column. For the next 200 years, the senators would address the new emperor by saying, reign fortunately like Augustus, and virtuously like Trajan. Thanks for watching the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel or like the video. You can find the sources used for this video in the description below. The next video in this series will be on Hadrian.